Hey, we know you had a choice of infotainment this afternoon, and I'm certain you've made the right one. More to the point, in these challenging times, Town Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we can't do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce virtual content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow, to even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if Zoom or YouTube fatigue hasn't set in fully, many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. But back to this afternoon. Uh, the program will run probably close to an hour in total. Uh, it'll feature an audience Q&A at the end. Richard and Kathleen will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom of your screen. We can't guarantee they'll be able to address everyone, but they'll try to get to as many as possible. And please keep your questions concise to facilitate that. Also know that you can view the event on Crowdcast right here or our YouTube page if you want to utilize the closed captioning feature. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include our 14th annual Urban Poverty Forum, focusing this time on black voter suppression. Rick Perlstein about uh, conservative politics and the rise of the Reagan revolution. Uh, Dr. Madeline Levine on about how to serve best our children while playing the dual roles of parent and teacher during COVID-19. Uh, Suzanne Nossel and Dinal Mangestu on protecting freedom of speech from forces on the right and the left, uh, as well as a future file including Cass Sunstein, Aaron Brockovich, Tom Hartman, Jill Lepore, Senators Sherrod Brown and Chris Murphy, Michael Ian Black, and Alex Ross in conversation with Ann Powers. You'll find plenty more about most of those already posted online at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of many sponsors. I'll name a few. Arts and culture programs in particular are supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight. The response to COVID-19 has brought great challenges to nonprofits in America. Town Hall alone has cut its budget by over a third in an effort to navigate the coming year. And so we're truly grateful to you for purchasing a ticket for this afternoon's program. If you support Town Hall's mission to make ideas and inspiration accessible to the whole community here, we hope you will consider further support with a membership or by making a donation through the bottom button at the bottom of your screen. Last, this isn't an easy time for booksellers either. And since we know you will want to spend more time with um, with the words featured in Emigres and today's talk, we, I hope you'll, I will urge you to buy a copy of the book and to do it now through our local independent partners at Third Place Books using the button at the bottom of the screen. Do it now instead of later through one of those stateless multinational everything stores that <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Professor Richard Scholar specializes in French at Durham University, where he's also a member of the Institute of Medieval and Early Modern Studies. His research lies in French language and literature, emphasizing early modern studies, comparative literature, translation and transcultural studies, and word histories, which explains his own bi bibliography, 2005's Je ne sais quoi in early modern Europe, Encounters with a Certain Something, and 2010's Montaigne and the Art of Free Thinking. Other works include Thinking with Shakespeare, Comparative and Interdisciplinary Essays from 2007, Fiction and the Frontiers of Knowledge in Europe, 1500 to 1800 from 2010, and Caribbean Globalizations, 1492 to the present day, published in 2015. Kathleen Kane began her career in Seattle writing and producing documentaries and talk shows for television and radio. She's hosted a two-hour interview program on the legendary KRAB-FM, was a contributing editor of the Seattle Weekly, and a writer and creative director at Heckler & Associates before founding her own communications consulting firm, Kane Creative. Professor Scholar's book, Emigres, French Words That Turned English, is the subject of this afternoon's talk. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen Kane and Richard Scholar. There we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome, and uh, welcome to Mr. Scholar. That's the last time I'll call you that. From now on, you'll be, <laughs> you'll be Richard, but- Anytime, you know, Kathleen. As I've said before, I love saying Mr. Scholar. First things first, I'm gonna plug this book. Okay, there it is. I was in the advertising world, so I know what uh, how to plug a book. Uh, it's a fabulous book. I'm happy that it's being sold by Third Place Books. I work, I often sneak off to Seward Park's Third Place Books to do my work. Hey, Charlie, can I get a glass of water? A little aside there, sorry. Um, so the button is kind of between Richard and me and hit that buy the book button and buy this wonderful book. So I think that's, there it is. It's a beautiful book too. And um, you can judge, judge think we, have, we each have a copy. And uh, if you can judge a book by its cover, this is a fine example. Before I ask you any serious questions, that reminds me, who did those beautiful little 
illustrations oh, at yeah. the front of each chapter. They're they're beautiful. Well, the answer is it. Um, I think it's someone very clever in the Princeton uh, design team, ah. and I uh, the I'll be able to, you and I could find this the answer out. Um, Richard, I looked. I'm looking the inside the book, but what I want to, but but it was a very important part of the conception of the book that. As I was working on these words, I kept being, um, I mean, of course, words are, are fascinating in their own right, but they're always, they always carry something with them, a material history, they're connected to objects, they're connected to ways of life and doing things. And I kept noticing as I was researching these particular words that interested me that, that, they, that they have, um, ob that they name objects. Uh, so for example, um, one of my words, as you know, Kathleen is naive, naivety, um, and I discovered in working on this book that uh, that in English a naif with an F um, is, is 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 a word used for a rough diamond. Um, so that's just one example of 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 an object that kind of haunted the word as I was um, working on it. And I, just, I had the idea that it would be great to to bring that into the book by um, by 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 commissioning, if we could, these little vignettes at the outset of each chapter. Um, I'd also been inspired by, oddly, by my, my daughter uh, B's Philip Pullman books. I don't know how well-known Philip Pullman yeah. is to you all, but he, he has these wonderful vignettes at the beginning of his chapters in his, in his ch stories for children of all ages. So, um, so I, I raised the possibility with my editor at, at Princeton and wasn't quite sure whether they would go for it, but they didn't only go for it. They found a clever uh, and visually imaginative person in the design team who, who did the work. Yeah, so that's the, an opportunity to thank the, the Princeton lot too for, for a beautiful job. Yes, one of the things I noticed, when you, as you read the book, you begin to understand what really clever depictions those uh, illustrations mm. are. You, know, you only have that one chance to do it all and um they're very clever people should do when they when they buy the book they should check that out because they're beautiful mm -hmm. and it also kind of reminds me of i'm moving ahead a little bit the whole caprice thing the idea of merging mm -hmm. different arts and this is an example of the the visual depicting um yep. the written word and and vice versa so first of all let's back up a little um how did you come to write a book about french words colonizing english um we talked a little bit about what you've done in your career, but um, how did how did you get there? Well, um, the story starts with my mum, I think, as so many stories must start for everybody. Um, I grew up. I'm an English. Um, I have no French background at all. But my mum um, is a French teacher, a French translator. I learned French at school, but she was always there to uh, answer my nerdy grammar questions as I was learning the language at school. And then we went, we'd have holidays in France. I just became fascinated with this, uh, this, you know, this wonderful neighbor, country that neighbors the one I grew up in. Um, uh, and I studied French and English together at university. I suppose I was already starting to think about the connections, the, all of the tangle of connections that, that, that exist between those two countries and their cultures. Um, and so over the years, I just kept noticing how how English, I mean, English turns to all sorts of uh, foreign languages in order to grasp at some meaning or some idea that it finds difficult to express in, as it were, standard language. Um, but, but, but I was struck uh, again and again by uh, how French was providing so many of those words and not just quantities either, but qualities of words, you know, words that... Um, as I said just a moment ago, seem to capture something that otherwise might elude the, the English language. Um, and that took me into my, into my, my doctoral work. So um, as was just mentioned, my first book was on, actually it was a kind of his, the excavation of, of the life and times of a single French phrase, the, the, the je ne sais quoi, you know, the, the indefinable something that makes a thing what it is. Um, and um, in following the history of that phrase in, in, into all sorts of um, unusual places, um, I, I came back to England and noticed that, you know, English was uh, one of the languages that borrows that phrase very early from about the middle of the 17th century onwards. 
And um, that, that, that work took me into the much broader, if you like, phenomenon of uh, whereby English borrows words from, from French, borrows phrases from French. And um, English in all of its historic and geographic dimensions too. I mean, I, I started from, from the English of the UK or, or England, but, um, but it's absolutely, it was absolutely clear to me as I was going that um, this, is a, this is by now a kind of uh, a phenomenon that has followed English all over the globe. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the, that's, that's the story really, Kathleen. It's a, it's a, a kind of abiding, um, uh, an abiding obsession, perhaps is too strong a word, but not far away from being an abiding obsession. And I wanted the chance to ask what it was about English or what it was that English did or uh, enabled itself to do in looking beyond its borders for the words and the phrases that would help it to achieve completeness of self-expression. Yeah, and of course, you talk about uh, there's a lot of French words that have emigrated to English, and why that is, is there's a couple of reasons. There's the obvious physical proximity, and then mm -hmm. there's that fraught historical relationship that, mm -hmm. I mean, and, it, and you know, you talk about English borrowing words from French. They were also inflicted on the, on sure. the according to some, to some uh, Brits, and the whole history from 1066, where they were colonized. Um, so one of the things I, I was thinking about when I read this is that that relationship is expressed differently. I mean, um, it, the English, there's a little a, a little more terror involved in the French. It's that kind of, oh, poof. It's like, it's like mm -hmm. bugger off, froggy. And then the response is, did somebody say something? <laughs> um, so are those, I mean, are, is that about, the, the differences in that relationship is that about cultural style or about the history or what do you what do you think? Mm. I like you. I go back to 1066, and I realize this is a long time ago now. But um, you know these the, the, the 1066, the Battle of Hastings, the the, the the formative event in the Norman conquest of England. Um, uh, cultural, you know, th these things live long in the cultural memory of a, of a, of, of a people. And um, 1066 is the, the first date that any British kid learns at school. And there's a reason why that might be. And, uh, and it does ex exactly have to do with uh, the, you know, a major colonial trauma, if you like. Um, uh, a colonial trauma that brought with it all sorts of things that define English and British culture and society today. But one of the things that defines it is precisely that sense that um, this was a moment in which uh, the country was, you know, the Saxon, Saxon England was overtaken by the uh, brute force and the civilization of, 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 of the Normans. Um, and uh, it's a very, I mean, uh, it's a very powerful abiding uh, cultural myth. You only have to think of Robin Hood. Um, Robin Hood is precisely the story of, you know, if you like, the doughty Anglo-Saxon, true Anglo-Saxon yeoman of England um, defeating those nasty Normans in the guise of, you know, Guy of Gisborne and all the rest of them. Um, so... Uh, again, I think there's a reason why that cultural myth persists. And of course, what comes along with it too is, um, uh, so is, is a kind of co very contradictory um, set of feelings in, 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 in British cultural identity. Uh, Fran Nor First Normandy then and then France uh, has brought so much in the way of, 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 of culture and learning and so on and law um and at the same time that inheritance is the mark of a of, of a kind of humiliation or if, uh, of, a, of a conquest so um i think you know if you turn the thing around and look and ask about that french what's the word insouciance they might say uh, in relation to 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 the anglo-saxons as they as they call both the english and the americans um yeah, that's got to do with the sense that they were there, well, they, at least in Britain, they were there first. And the subsequent rise of the British Empire in the 17th, uh, what, the 18th and 19th centuries 
uh, is a sort of um, embarrassing fact of later history, which then the global uh, dominance of the US in the 20th century on has confirmed. Uh, there's plenty of resentment in France towards uh, all of that, um, even to this day. And of course, um, uh, that's a, that, that, that would take a second uh, book, a companion volume, maybe, who knows. But, um, but certainly the way it's treated in, in France is very different. And it is met with a kind of, um, on the whole, a kind of um, uh, bemused and slightly haughty disdain. A shrug, a shrug. That a famous, shrug, that, a Gallic that, shrug. That yeah. famous Gallic shrug. Yeah, and it's funny. I was entered, I was amused to find at the end of your book, you quoted that uh, Boris Johnson thing where he says, "If we don't do Brexit, we're in danger of becoming a colony." And my husband, the first time we listened to the BBC a lot because my husband is from from Ireland, in, uh, from the north of Ireland, and uh, mm. first time we heard that phrase, I remember Charlie looking at the radio and saying, "Yeah, Boris sucks, doesn't it?" It's it's ironic. It's it's ironic that he's worried about being a colony because, like, you know, they've been on the other side of it for quite some time. And Absolutely. also, in my house, you know, people. Uh, I don't know. If it's it's an American thing when people swear. They will say, "Pardon my French," which is mm -hmm. just the way. Of, well, here we say, "Pardon my Anglo-Saxonism," because because most of those swear words are are pretty much uh, Anglo-Saxon and not not borrowed from French. But absolutely right. Uh, anyway, yeah. so um. There, I'm going to get down a little into the weeds because you did. That's your fault. Um, there are some parts of the book that are, the book glides along, and then there are parts that are a little difficult because they're, you know, about philology, if that's the correct thing, and all kinds of mm -hmm. other things. There are some terms in the book that you talk about, keywords, and then your book, Emigre, or your word, Emigre, how that differs. Well, it's not your word, but your name for it, how that differs. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about creolization, which has had a whole new me you know if i were to stat take a stab at what you meant by that before i read the book mm. it would have been very different mm. so can you explain what keywords are in your field if that's not too is that going too deep no, no okay, let me have go. a go let me have a go so um i uh, let me start by saying that i owe the notion of the keyword to a very great um Welsh, Eng a Welsh literary critic by the name of a um, uh, left wing literary critic by the name of Raymond Williams who was very interested, if you like, um, who, wrote, who wrote a book called Keywords in the late 70s. Um, and um, he had, I mean, there's a biographical sort of uh, background to this work. He'd been a young man in the Second World War and then came, went to Cambridge to study afterwards. And when he got to Cambridge uh, as a boy from the Welsh borders who'd fought in the Second World War and suddenly among the, the intellectual and social elite of England in Cambridge, he just couldn't understand a lot of what people said. And lots of the words that he thought he, I mean, there are lots of, the, lots of words he recognized, you know, words like culture or society, but what, what those words carried, what they, what they were used to do and to say were new to him. And what he came, what he took from that was that, um, if you like, there are certain words in in common use um, that that that, ca that carry such a kind of charge in 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 the way that they use that that which means that they they have that function of uh, of of what he called a keyword. So it's a word that that is difficult, you know, that is complex in its meaning, that, that is used by different people to, to mean slightly different things, that a word that might in its own way be a kind of object of conflict between different people. You know, so what you mean by culture might be very different from what I mean by culture, but we both think that that word matters to us and we want to have an argument about its meaning and its uses. So that's the sort of sense of, of what, I meant, what I mean by a keyword, and I borrow that from, from Raymond Williams. Um, Williams wrote a, a sort of a kind of vocabulary of British modern British culture and society. He he chose about a hundred words that ranged from oh, art and aesthetic to somewhere like something like work towards the end of the A to Z. Um, and it's a really wonderful study. Um, it's a study that sort of tries to excavate um, the way that language is used and how that um, yeah 
offers people, if you like, a kind of liberation from language by offering them a step back from language to think about what it is that people mean when they use words in particular ways. I come into this story, I suppose, because I was struck by how little Williams interested himself in words of foreign derivation. So his vocabulary of English um, and British culture and society through English seemed to me to be quite Anglo-centric, if you like. Um, whereas, you know, I was struck by how many words English borrows, uh, sorry, how many key words English borrows, words that it uses quite, that English speakers use quite commonly as they talk about the central processes of their lives. Um, and so what I wanted to suggest in the book was that um, we need to, if you like, add to Williams's category of the key word, the key word that's borrowed, the, the key word that's, that's drifted into the language from somewhere else. And since I was interested in French words in particular, you can, you can see why I thought of an, emi, uh, of an emigre word as being, uh, an emigre, of, of course, being an example of this very process of, of borrowing. Um, shall I say a word about where I see creolization in all of this? Yeah, I mean, because it's an interesting, I mean, the, the, what I got from it, and it's kind of close to what I assumed before I read the book, is creolization is a mixing in a situation where there's an unequal power relationship, which Americans can kind of understand in terms of how we think of, of the creole culture and, and what yeah. happened. So, so yeah, yeah I was, absolutely right. So I... So it's back to 1066 and all that. I was trying to understand what it was, what it was that made for this ambivalence in English culture towards the words that we've that have come in from from, from French, and um, and I was, and it's just as you described. I think it's got to do with um, it's a process of mixing the mixing of of, of one language into another, which. Um, which, which takes place in this context of, of, of a highly unequal power relation between, between Norman conquered England and uh, the Anglo-Saxon in, uh, inhabitants. Um, and I was looking for the appropriate historical context, the, historic, the, the appropriate sort of idea for understanding this, this mixture of creative possibility that French offers English and the sense that it takes place in a highly unequal relation of power, which which is resented, uh, and and so on, um, and it's it's the Caribbean that um, that helped me. Um, uh, it was um, yeah, I think it was mentioned earlier that I'd done some work on the Car the Caribbean. The Caribbean is a fascinating um, its history, its deeply troubled history of colonial domination, conquest. The, the 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 way in which the different European powers conquer different parts of the Caribbean, all of that has led Caribbean historians to describe creolization as not just a kind of uh, oh you know not just a sort of um, neutral a, a mixing sure a mixing of cultural elements a mixing of ling of languages and cultures and so on but not one that takes place in a sort of um, uh, you know, on a on a nice beach in, in the Caribbean, but one that take, that took place on the on on the plant on the on the slave plantations on the on the slave ships that came from 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 West Af well, from Europe to West Africa and to the Caribbean, and so what I just was became very interested in the ways in which it helped to think about my topic French words mixing with English. As obviously a, a, an adapt, you know, an adapt, uh, in a different situation, but nonetheless a, a, a similar one uh, to, of of of, of creolization. creolization. Creolization helped me when adapted and thought through in a different context to to get at that mixture of of create of creative possibility and highly unequal power relation. And yeah. it's kind of interesting because you know, it allows. English, you know, British culture doesn't think of itself as, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very happy to think of itself as at some level triumphant or, 
in control of history. And it, so it's, it was kind of how it was kind of helpful to me and fun to think against the grain and, and creolization helped me to do that. Yeah, and I, I, I liked it. It's a fascinating part of the book. I was surprised to find it there, um, which kind of reminds me just to talk about the fact that the book, which you can buy from the button below, <laughs> um, does a lot more than just talk about words. Uh, you know, I sort of thought it would be all about words becoming, in, you know, implanted in the language. And actually, it, do, it does much broader things. And you talk about literature as a way of, um, of looking at, at these mm. words and how they've entered the, the English language, which is interesting. And you cover three words, um, ennui, caprice, and uh, what did I miss? What's the other Naivete. One? Naivete. As Naivete. in our rough diamond from earlier. Yes, yeah. the rough diamond, that's right. And uh, before I move on to talk about those though, um, I just wanted to talk about the fact that um, it, this history sort of makes people, Americans at least, maybe mm. I assume Brits too, it makes uh, English speaking Americans a little self-conscious about using French words. You know, there's always that sort of hesitation. Mm. Your chapter on Caprice talks about sheep and goats and it sort of uh, clicked with me because, um, and the relation from uh, between Caprice and the, and the word goat in other languages and that wandering quality. L the week before I, a week ago, I was on vacation with my husband in a town called Walla Walla in Eastern Washington. You think Ireland has weird town names. Um, and they, they have, they, they raise sheep and goats and they make cheese. And so people would go, I've had this ever since I've known these people. He's from France, she's from Walla Walla. So people would say, I would be texting like where I am and why I can't get in touch with you. And I would say, I'm visiting the, my friends, the Montiers at, at there. And I would have this little struggle and I wanted to say farm. Well, no, it's not just a farm. They don't raise these animals. I want to say dairy, but it's not really a dairy because they don't collect it. What they do is they make cheese and I would struggle and I couldn't say cheese farm. And then I'd go, just say fromagerie, just type the word fromagerie, which is what Pierre-Louis and Joan call it. And I always had that little moment of going, don't sound like a jerk. Don't type fromagerie. But I had to admit, mm. that's the word in English for what they do, unless you want to say cheese farm. Uh, so there is that resistance that English speakers have. Um, that's, it's about that history, I assume. Yes, and I think it's about what goes along with that history, which is at least in in terms of Britain, you know. Well, I'm sure in the US too. It's it's a, it's it's about um, it's about class. It's about access to education. Um, yeah. You know, if you're um, if you're able to deal with these words and to use these words with some sort of ease and facility, that suggests that you've got a whole baggage. A whole, a whole bag, a whole kind of set of cultural capital that suggests that you have, uh, you know, that you have a certain standing in in society, and that is both something that's something that's both desired by some people, um, resented by others, mocked. I mean, there's all sorts of, um, uh, com you know, comedies in in um, uh, and sat satirical texts that have to do with. Uh, English speakers who use yeah. uh, French imprecisely, uh, and 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 you know that's from all sorts of different political viewpoints. But it all has to do, I think, with so so yeah. yeah in, at some level, it's, it, uh, it takes us way back to to, to 1066 and all that. But it's also got to do with what's what's embedded in 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 in, in English speaking cultures, um, which has to do with their odd relation towards foreign languages and yeah. the sense that do we really need to learn them. Well, if we do, perhaps it's well. If we think we do, perhaps it's because we're able to. Perhaps it's, that's because we've got enough money or standing to be able to do so. Um, yeah, and, I mean, and I, yeah, we so, and we and to sort of get away from that snobbery, we sort of try to make jokes about it. Which reminds me, I told mm. you earlier in an email that my friend uh, Neil Connedy told me about the. Uh, uh, American term vuja day, which is that feeling that I have never ever been here before. I absolutely <laughs> love that. I love that. Um, <laughs> no. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. I, we Deja vu never. becomes vuja day, and you know day. one of the thing, one of the reasons I loved it is that um, I don't. You know, you, you might know that the the whole linguistic phenomenon. This is within French now um, of 
what the French call verlan. So it's a very, so basically, um, it's a whole language that's grown up in the suburbs of Paris in, in working class and uh, often underprivileged suburbs of Paris and which has to do with taking words, uh, the words that, that French uses all the time, and twisting them around. So, uh, you know, a fa une femme a woman becomes in Verlan meuf. Um, you, you take the word and you switch it around and that becomes the word in Verlan. And Verlan is itself, the word Verlan is itself an example of it because it's the, the language à l'envers, turned the wrong way around. And obviously part of that, there's a political charge to that kind of linguistic creativity, which has got to do with subverting the, the ordinary world, the ordinary order of things in French and turning the language upside down to show that you you, you can take that control over it. So there's a kind of revolutionary impulse in Verlon. And I saw your friend's Vujardé <laughs> as a kind of English version of yeah. Verlon. It was a, a creative turning upside down of one of those French phrases that's turned English. Um, and, and in English, it's sort of, it's actually kind of the spoonerism. And um, I love spoonerisms because you switch you can make those mistakes and come up with wonderful words. And there's a lot of words in my family that we just don't say the right way anymore because mm. the spoonerism or the, or, uh, what's it called in French? What do they call that? Oh. Oh, yeah. Canonbourg. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a similar kind of thing. But it so is, yeah. I want to talk about some of the words that are, um, that you dedicate chapters to. The first one being ennui. Uh, which is again one of those untranslatables. There's just not quite a word in English to deal with that. And but the thing I found most interesting about what I discovered about ennui is that it one of the definitions of the French senses of it is the feeling that time is no longer passing, that you're eternally in the now. And mm. I, it, you know, there's this thing that's that's pretty ultra modern, which is everyone's saying, be in the now, you know, live in the moment. And then I read that and thought, no, that's that's the French idea of hell, that that you're always living in the moment it might be pretty horrible. Yeah. And, um, so so ennui is a little more than boredom. And um, what, just, what do you it is in, about that? It is indeed, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I suppose the question, uh, it's all very well to be in the here and now, but it depends what your here and now is, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> Quite a few of the situations that ennui captures um, uh, are intolerable, but they're in, um, and partly what makes them intolerable is that they're just not, there, there is no end, there's no prospect of an end in sight. Um, and that, you know, the English word boredom, it would be a near equivalent and is often used alongside ennui to sort of get us somewhere in the right sort of area. But, Henri has a much greater sort of, um, yeah, almost like an existential charge to it. Um, it and I think that helps in, uh, in English. And, and, and that is a huge challenge to art of all kinds. I mean, one of the things I was interested in the book was literature, as you said, and, um, but, but also there, there, there's, you know, I was interested in what it is to paint Henri um, as various people have done. And of course, in a sense, Henri, is a fundamental existential threat to the whole idea of art, of artistic activity. If artistic activity is about creating something in the moment, uh, here is this thing on that comes along and threatens almost to sort of drain the moment of its creative possibility. So there's a sort of eternal struggle between art and ennui, which I wanted to follow. Um, and you know that took me to a wonderful painting of of of, of, of a kind of English an English painting of Henri from the early twentieth century, which has a couple in a in a middle class in their in their drawing room or in their parlor or whatever, and they're they're kind of both they're turned away from one another, one staring at the wall, the other one's gazing into vacancy. Virginia Woolf wrote, wrote a wonderful essay about this painting, and you know. The painter tries to paint Henri in this way. Virginia Woolf comes along and writes her essay, which attempts to conjure into words something of the desperation of that painting. And in their own way, each of the arts comes to Henri and tries to do something different with it, but but connected. 
Yeah, and, so, and somebody wrote about it, assuming that that these people, that the painting, there's an illustration, a reproduction of it in the book, that these two extremely uh, bored people uh, uh, ran, a, ran a bar or a pub, that they were mm. in the she's about to go. And I, you look at it, it wasn't what I got. I thought they were hanging around in their, you know, little bourgeois home, and there's a French mm. word. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, gee, running a bar should be more fun than that. They're just up there yawning between customers, which, which is more of a, an English depiction of, of owning a bar than American or French, maybe. It's interesting. Yeah, and the, the killing thing about that painting is that the drink, there's a drink on the corner, on, on the center of the table, you know, uh, right in the center of the painting. You expect, and it's in, in a sort of decanter, so you're expecting, I don't know, port or, or uh, uh, you know, or, or beer or some, some, some drink that would give some alcoholic cheer, but it's, it's just nothing but yeah, water. It looks, like, it looks like water, yeah. And that, and that, was, very, that was a very interesting um, thing to point out. Also, you talk about paired words before, um, I move away from ennui. Uh, it's so typical of the two languages, their sounds, their their attitude that we they have ennui and we have spleen. <laughs> it's mm. just like one of them's kind of graceful and airy and talks about soul sickness, and I've always thought of spleen as being a kind of a simmering resentment or anger. And it's interesting that you mentioned that they're paired. Yeah. Um they are paired and they're, they're also kind of um, two sides of the same coin because uh, just as English writers and English, the language borrows and takes ennui in and makes use of it in English, so uh, French borrows spleen from English um, and often pairs, so often the two languages pair ennui and spleen together but they're each of them doing it from, the, from, from opposite angles. And I think you know that again suggested to me that um, that what I was observing in in English, English in its relation to the foreign or its its borrowing from foreign languages in order to get at something elusive, um, you know that 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 process also happens in French, and um, it was fun to to you to see that that was a good example of 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 a yeah of an experience that sort of hovers on the edge of both of the languages, and they both need. To borrow and pair and use a yeah. bit of linguistic bric-a-brac, if I may, use of another think, French phrase to, to, to get at. Yeah, and uh, thinking about that, I, I'm also interested in how words look in different, it's like different forms of speech as, as words move around in the lexicon and the grammar, they change quality. And I always found spleen mm -hmm. kind of this. I don't know, kind of awful looking word and sounding word, but splenetic. All of a sudden it mm. just goes to another level. Now that's a word, splenetic. And and it's sad little <laughs> parent spleen is just kind of sad and a little bit icky because there's the, the organ as well. Um, before we leave Ennui, I just want to put in a plug for Maria Edgeworth, who I love. She's an Irish novelist. It's not as well known mm -hmm. over here, I don't think, as in England. And um, she wrote a book called Ennui. And I love her work, and people should read mm. it. It's the, uh, oh, yeah. It's a shame we haven't got a, a copy to hold up and, and yeah. plug. Uh, <laughs> Maria Edgeworth is not as, as well known as she should be. Uh, yeah here over here in these islands are either in in in, in her native island or indeed in, in British Isles. I mean she gets she gets lost in literary history uh, Jane Austen came yes. and kind of got in the way uh, and does something very kind of ang very sort of quintessentially English at some level um, in her depiction of English society whereas Maria Edgeworth was a real cosmopolitan you know she was uh, Irish but she was highly connected with the with 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 the with 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 England and the and the continent and she's constantly writing novels about people who cross between those different uh, places languages cultures Henri is the story of um, a class it's the story of how a an English arist aristocrat a young English aristocrat who's immensely wealthy and super bored with his life because he's got no challenges it's how he is how he's cured of his ennui essentially by by the astonishing discovery um, that he isn't, in fact, an English aristocrat, but a uh, an, an Irish lad uh, with of, of 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 humble birth, 
um, and suddenly, you know, in, in his middle life or it's age 30 or something, he, he, he's lost, he's, he's, if you like, lost his title, lost his lands, lost his, his ennui, and he has to start again and, and make something of his life. And uh, so it's a story about how Ireland cures the, the English aristocrat of ennui, which of ennui. tickled me pink uh, yeah. for various reasons having to do with my own personal circumstances. <laughs> Right, and yes, and we should mention you're in West Cork right now, which also brings to mind Somerville and Ross. Um, yeah. They're also delightful. I think of them and and of Maria Edgeworth as kind of, I, I love Jane Austen. I read Jane Austen way too much. Oh, me too. Um, but I think of the, them as sort of the unfussy Jane Austen. You know, it's a little mm. less concerned with, um, with writing excellent. And it's not that she doesn't write well, it, it's difficult to talk about, but you know, it's just a more relaxed mm. environment and tone than Austin, even though she writes at the same time period, but. Yeah. Um, so um, so the other thing that when you're talking about writers who are not appreciated, it moves on to the other word that you have the chapter about, which is caprice, which is also a wonderful word. And um, I wasn't aware of the scarf, uh, there's a scarf that's called capri uh, caprice. Mm. But when you're talking about caprice, you mention another unsung writer who's from my neighborhood. We're going to move from from mm. West Cork to the Pacific Northwest, which is George Bowery, who is a contemporary yeah. Canadian novelist who is not read mm. enough. And um, yeah. and he wrote a book called Caprice. I want you to talk a little bit about why that intrigued you and how it relates to what you have to say about Caprice. But before I go there, you mention uh, in, in that chapter, there are there were a great number of mediocre Edwardian novels titled Caprice that I saved you from reading uh, by choosing, by recommending this one. Just how many bad <laughs> Edwardian novels are there called Caprice? Who'd have thought? Yeah, well, it's like, you know, it, I unleashed myself on a, on a library, a, a good research library, and I, I probably came up with half a dozen. I mean, um, and they're often sort of um, soft social comedies in which someone does something a little bit out of the ordinary and that somehow qualifies as a caprice. I was much, much interested in a much more pungent kind of caprice, a goatish Caprice, uh, you recalled earlier that cap the Caprice, the, the etymologically is related related to the the goat who who doesn't follow the you know the the, the straight who doesn't follow the straight and narrow but capers along the, the the precipices and breaks all the rules essentially, which is where you know which is what which 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 is what Caprice encapsulates um, a kind of um, a deviation a devi uh, a deviancy from the norm. Um, and I was interested in the way in which all sorts of uh, writers have 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 tapped into that energy, the energy of that word to do their own caprice, you know, to to break the rules in their own way. Um, that takes us to George Bowring. George Bowring again, you know, kind of if Margaret Atwood hadn't happened, or poss and yeah. possibly Michael Ondaatje, we'd know much more about George Bowring. But we should. We should be reading him. He's a fantastic writer, and what he's interested in, his novel Caprice is both. It's it is in its in itself a Caprice. It wants to break the rules, but it's also the story of a woman called Caprice. Um, she is a she's from she's Quebecoise. She's from French uh, from Quebec, and. Obviously, Bowering as a Canadian novelist is interested in the contact zone between English and French, which which is Canada. Um, um, it's a Caprice. So it's the story of this woman called Caprice. She's from Quebec, but she finds herself way out west in British Columbia at the end of the 19th century. And she finds herself in a Western I mean, she finds herself in a cowboy and Indian story, but it's a cowboy and Indian story with a difference because its its central protagonist is not, you know, anyone that Clint Eastwood could play, but a red-headed six-foot um, poetic uh, poetic uh, Caprice who is on a quest to avenge her her brother's death. Um, 
So why is this novel a capital? Well, it's a novel it, because, like lots of these of these artistic capitals, I was interested in it. Both it breaks the rules, but in breaking the rules, it also reminds you what those rules are. Um, it's you can, in, in a sense, what what Caprice teaches you is that you can only, you know, the best way of deviating from from a norm is reminding your reader or your spectator of that norm, even as you break it. So. Um, what the norm is in the case of Barry's novel is the, is the Western. So this is a, uh, at one level, it's a story of revenge taking place between, you know, um, where the cowboys and the Indians are um, in, in, the, in the foreground of the plot. But these are cowboys and Indians with a very serious difference so that each time you encounter those, or, you know, those cliched, um, those stereotypes of the Western, you're being shown a completely different take on them, uh, with Caprice at the, at the heart of it. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, it's a Canadian Caprice, and that was one of the things that was exciting for me about this topic was that it was a topic that uh, uh, enables us to travel to different, as I said at the beginning, to different parts of the world in which French and English have rubbed up against one another and, and, and this friction has created possibilities. Yes, and in Canada there's that reverse with the French, the, the, in, the Quebecois kind of isolated there and having that defensiveness about their language that the English have of protecting mm -hmm. their language from French and the French uh, trying to protect their language in the middle of a, of a British, what's a British col colony, and the tongue trooper thing, the kind of way where they become that expression, they become very, very concerned about making sure everything's written in English and French. And mm. I mean, I understand that, but Canadians like to uh, sort of fetch about that. But uh, before <laughs> before we leave uh, George Bowring, I just want to set, put a plug in for him. His books are wonderful, and Caprice mm. is part of a trilogy. Yes. The first book imagines George Vancouver. Uh, mm. Exploring, and then then it moves. That's the second one. Capri is the woman, that's and then right. the third one's very modern mm. about um, natives, about uh, yeah. three three young men, I think, who commit a crime. It's been a while, but that's he teaches right. that. I think he's still there at, at Simon Fraser. He's he lives in Vancouver. He grew up in Penticton, which is just north of the town where I spent my late mm. adolescence in Spokane and Washington. And my first trip with a friend away from home was to drive up to Penticton. Mm. Oh, how exciting. Uh, the, the town that Bowering couldn't wait to leave. But but he's an amazing uh, person. I'm surprised, again, a writer that more people don't don't know about. Uh, the mm. other person is Robertson Davies. I think of him. I think of Antakti mm. and, and mm -hmm. um, yes. Margaret Atwood and Robertson Davies as yeah. kind of the giants. And Bowering belongs in that group. He's prolific and mm. his writing is uh, very capricious. Um, before, and I, Somebody has to nudge me over at Town Hall to let us know when we're running out of time. But before we leave that, I just want to pat you on the back because one of your uh, topics, wow. writing about Caprice, Caprice was dealing with uh, these uh, Capriccio, which was a Strauss opera. And you wrote there the most succinct little precy, as the French say, uh, <laughs> about that pretty much describes the action in every comic opera or comic play ever written. You say about Capriccio, the Aristos command everything but their feelings, the artists seek social advancement through their art and nothing is lost on the servants. I mean, congratulations, that's every comic opera ever written. <laughs> uh, you do me too much honor. No, it's, it, it, I, 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 I really appreciate how succinct that was. Um, and then opera is, is also a capricious uh, mm. medium. Um, people find it silly, uh, especially yes. the comic operas, and that's not the case. No, and and certainly not in the in the case of that opera, which yeah is an extraordinary, extraordinary creation. I mean, I think opera is in its own way, yeah, flirting with all sorts of the things we've talked about uh, so far, which is wondrous creative possibility in the case of opera you know that um, the ability to be able to draw into its ambit the written word the the, the, the musical line um, physical theater uh, set design art uh, through all those things it's it's you know um, and and yet at the same time all of that is always kind of surrounded with all sorts of or um, 
social amb ambivalence, you know, um, can we really spend so much of our resources on this stuff and shouldn't we be thinking about uh, what what surrounds it when it stops? Um, and Capriccio, Strauss's opera, is an extraordinary kind of and very troubling meditation on some of that, I think. Um, it, yeah. And the main, uh, um, I'm, the main question is not answered, which is mm. who will she choose? Which is kind of a brave choice. I mean, <laughs> you know, and he, he gets away with it. But I mean, you, you sort of say that that makes it come into the, that with what brings it into the real world when it's over mm -hmm. is that, it's that open-endedness, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, so speak in the, also in the chapter on Caprice, and I, I just want to say at this point in this interview, most people will be as surprised as I was to learn that I was reading a book about words and I started thinking about all other kinds of things. I mean, it's not etymology. It's, it's, it's a meditation on art and society and culture and status. And, um, uh, it, it's just an amazing book in how how far and wide you go. It's got, it's a capricious book, uh, but in a in a serious way. So, but you Thank talk. You well, I mean, it's it's the truth. I I never lie except when I need to. Um, so, one of the things you <clears throat> mentioned is something I didn't know anything about. I love Shakespeare. I'm one of the founding members of the Seattle Shakespeare Company, which has been around mm. twenty something years now. Um, and um, I have to put a plug in for my daughter. When we were first starting, we were struggling and we, we didn't have our own theater. We were a nomadic company and we used our children. We uh, sort of dragooned them into service as ushers. So the poor girl, when she was little, I'd drag her off and she'd be an usher and she'd pass out um, the programs at the beginning of every play. And now she likes to say to people, I've slept through more Shakespeare than you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, but so having said that and being a fan of Shakespeare, I did not know about the play Sir Thomas More, which he co-authored. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that in the chapter about Caprice and you have an uh, excerpt and of course it's Shakespeare. Is there any question that, that he wrote it? I mean, we can't figure out whether he wrote his own plays. How do you know he co-authored this play? Well, um, that it's an extraordinary story, um, but uh, so th th this this play, which is a play, a, a kind of history of the, the the life and times of of, of Thomas More, um, uh, who obviously you know um, had lived and died earlier in this in the century. This play um, clearly written by several people, and. Uh, the, the passage that I quoted comes from a fragment of the play written in the, I think, the only surviving example we have of, of Shakespeare's own handwriting. I mean, I take um, my lead on this from all sorts of textual scholars who've, who have, have established this, I think, to beyond any particular kind of um, doubt. Um, so in a way, oddly enough, we can be more sure that he wrote this fragment of a play than we can be sure that he wrote many of the more famous plays. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, I mean, you know, you just have to read the, the passage to know that it, it springs from the same well of language and idea and yeah. thought as the great plays that we all love. And I hope that your company in Seattle, has, I'm sure, has performed them brought to people um the the passage in question is is a, is a wonderful speech in which thomas more in the play uh is trying to quell a riot in london a, a riot against french and dutch foreigners in the city you know um settled people people who've, who've moved from france and the whole and and, and and um the low countries to london they've been drawn there and there's a riot against the, 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 the immigrants in the city. And Moore um, st stands in, in front of the crowd and uh, overcomes this or, or calms this riot with a speech in favor of the migrant, in, in favor of the, the, the person that's, that comes from outside into the city and enriches the life of the city. Um, he does so by asking, 
by reversing the situation for, for the rioters and saying, you know, well, how would it be for you if you had to leave your country as many French uh, settlers in England had had to? Um, if you'd had to leave the country and you'd come to a foreign place and you were treated in this way. Um, it's, so for me, it was a, a way of um, thinking through something very deep in, 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 in the book, which is that, yeah, as you said a moment ago, um, I mean, I don't know what a book about words would ever be if it was only about words. Words are spoken by people in history, they're people that things happen to and the words help them to make sense of that experience. And, um, you know, that's why I think th there's a very long uh, um, metaphorical association between words and people. We often talk about words as though they were people. We talk about, uh, and, 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 and we, we tell them the stories of words, the lives of words. We think about words as though they were people. And so um, I wanted to just wanted to end the book by suggesting that so many of our attitudes towards linguistic immigrants, you know, the bits of language that come to us from other places, reflect our attitudes towards the, the people uh, that bring those words into our societies. And we ought to think about that. We ought to think about that. I mean, Shakespeare could see that we needed to think about that in 16th century London, where there was a great resentment at times of, of the foreigners in the city and his words are as relevant today as they ever have been. Um, yeah. We live at a time when uh, more than one migration crisis is, uh, is currently um, happening. We shouldn't be, um, yeah, we, we need to be um, thoughtful about that but also about um, about, about what that means for our attitudes towards other things such as language and culture. Exactly. I, th I think our resistance to our acceptance of, of that kind of mixing and, and sh of cultural memes and, and words and phrases is a direct reflection on how we treat actual people. That, mm -hmm. that heart-rending speech in the play um, about what think about what if you were in this position made made me think of the people that are imprisoned on the border of my country it's it's mm. extremely topical and relevant as um mm. as a lot of shakespeare is i mean i think that's i think that's why um he, he's so revered you know people say oh english england colonized the world which it kind of did in the the english language because of england and america has kind of become the main language the lingua franca um partly because of dominance but i I think in terms of Shakespeare, I think uh, it's just because it is so brilliant. It is so apt. It never grows old. It speaks to every time. Mm -hmm. Every you can you can take a Shakespeare play and put it in a modern setting, and it still works. Mm -hmm. And um, that passage was particularly poignant because of what's happening right now. And it's interesting that you finish this book at a time when all of this is happening. I mean, that was. Mm -hmm. That's sad, but but um, it it kind of fed right into into your book. Yeah, it wasn't deliberate, you know. Um, yeah. It it just kind of uh, the, the 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 relevance of this topic to the situation that we're in um, just kind of it was an uncanny thing. It grew, yeah, and it grew upon me as I was writing it. Um, I wouldn't wish it that way particularly, but I felt like I needed to acknowledge it. Um, yeah. And and you and you have aptly. It's it's really wonderful. Um, I think I'm going to go to questions now. I got a little message, but before I do, there's just there's the book Emigre. Uh, I'm like mucking up the title by the aptly named Richard Scholar. God, <laughs> that must be awful to have that name sometimes. But it's a constant uh, challenge. Yeah, and I certainly haven't let you off the hook uh, about it. <laughs> um, the buy the book button is right below. But one of the things that you say in the book that I'm just going to read here before I go to that, I think we only have a, we have three questions, is um, while the English language needs and has always needed emigres to achieve elegance and completeness of self-expression, the English people have never learned to celebrate this fact about their language. Um, I think you're writing about English British culture, but it's it's also true perhaps to a lesser extent, uh, I, at least I used to think about America, but um, mm. that's really what it's about. It's about the, that it's just smarter to be open to cultural influence mm. and, to, and to mixing 
and to creolization e even on a f um, an equal level. So now um, I, I, they're going to remind me how to ask questions because if they don't, oh, how to read them. Okay. Okay. The first one is, um, okay. The, here's the deal. This is America. So we pretend to be a democracy. So people get to vote on which questions they like. Mm. So I'm going to read the ones with the highest votes and we have a tie uh, for number one. This is Sarah Oh, Gebal, I hope I'm saying your name right. Of course, there are so many French cognates in English, and there are also so many false cognates, faux amis. Mm. I'm wondering if you have noticed any patterns or threads regarding why cognates have become false cognates in going from French to English. Uh, Gosh, people. Sarah, that's a wonderful question. I think I would have voted for that one too. Good. Um, I'm not sure I've noticed any patterns uh, linguistically speaking of uh, but but what I have noticed is so yeah I mean there are, there are all sorts of kinds of interesting things I mean um, there there you find in English sometimes borrows a a word from French keeps its meaning and the word in French meanwhile disappears or changes so that down the line, the French borrowing in English looks like a faux ami, but it, at, at time t, at the time at which it first appeared, it wasn't. So um, a, a, an example of that is double entendre. Mm -hmm. You know, the sort of, how, how, do you phrase, how do you explain what a double entendre is? You know, the sort double of meaning. sexual, se yeah, the double meaning, the with sexual innuendo. Um, I don't think it, I mean, I, French, People don't talk about double entendre in that way anymore. But in the 17th century, when English borrowed that phrase, they did. Um, so, so, so there's all sorts of historical processes at play in, in the whole constitution of the Fuzami. The other thing I wanted to say is an opportunity to say it's kind of related, I think, is that English often loves to borrow, apparently borrow a French. Um, phrase or uh, something of French influence and use it to score a point against the French. So, you know, for example, um, we say in English that, you know, uh, somebody has taken French leave. To take French mm -hmm. leave means to bunk off, basically, and leave everyone in the lurch. Um, there's a way in which English presents that phrase as though it was somehow kind of a borrowing from French. Of course, it isn't. It's just a, an opportunity to poke fun or make uh, score a score a point against uh, against the French so um, yeah there's a whole I mean there's a book to be written about the fools I mean and I know what the title would be, um, <laughs> would it be so fools thank you for, yeah. what would the title be would that be well it? I think it might be fools I mean or, yeah yeah well, that's exactly. what I was thinking but uh, thank you Sarah uh, the next one is what's your favorite French expression that is used widely in English this is from Tina Escobar, by the way. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the whole book. The book is about that. So it's, it's hard to, for me to um, only have to be able to rescue one in that way. Um, let me try one on you just because um, it captures the dilemma you've put me into. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the phrase esprit d'escalier. So yeah. esprit d'escalier is literally the, 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 the thing that comes into your mind when you're on the stairs. Yeah. And it's it comes from the French writer, 18th century writer Diderot, I believe. And it pre des describes precisely that. It's what um, what a friend and colleague of mine once called your Sainsbury's moment. Sainsbury's is a famous, you know, um, uh, grocery store in the UK, I don't know uh, what the American equivalent would be, but it's the moment when you, you know, someone's asking you a difficult question and you just can't quite find the answer. And you go off to the store and it's when you're picking out your groceries and you stop thinking about the thing that the, the answer comes into your mind. Well, in the case of Esprit d'Escalier, the idea is you've just left the room and you're on the stairs and then that's the too late, the, um, the f too late the answer comes. So since I am now in that situation, I'm going to share with you esprit d'escalier as my favorite uh, French phrase in English. 
which in American is elevator moment. That's what everybody says here. It's, All it's right. Yeah. Elevator moment. The minute the doors close, you've left yeah. your boss's office, you've missed your chance to sling the bon mot, and you're in the elevator and the doors close and you go, ah. That's now that's really, that's really puzzling to me because I've also been taught the, I've also learned the phrase about an, uh, what is it, an elevator pitch, you know, where you that's different walk into an elevator and you've got a minute to sell your idea to the person standing. So do you, can you, would you have your escalator moment after your escalator pitch? Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you'd have, when you fail at your pitch, right? You've got that. You have your moment. You're doing the elevator pitch and the, the person's floor arrives and is a big and important elevator. guy and the door closes and you think, Oh my God, I could have got him to invest in my startup if I'd only said this. Mm. And uh, one of the strangest part of the work I do is I have to write elevator pitches for people. It's it's a it's an interesting, um, but yes, but and I like the the elevator moment and the elevator pitch paired together. I like that. That's that's good. Um, there's one more question. The, you've got a history quiz. You better be ready. Who? Oh, there it goes. Who was the first English king to speak English rather than French as his daily language? I feel like I'm on Jeopardy. Oh, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Laszlo either does or doesn't. This is a question. I wish he would. I'd love it if he would t tell us if he does know. Yeah, um, I mean, I would guess it's really quite late. Um, <laughs> and then the uh, fat evaporated instantly, right? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it must have been a brief moment. I mean, French is the language of the court. It's the language of law and uh, until... Oh, Certainly, um, you know, into the 17th century. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I was recently um, watching, I watched a wonderful program on the BBC about the letters that passed between Elizabeth I and Mary, Queen of Scots at the end of the 16th century. And, you know, one of the things that was extraordinary was that they were, I mean, to, to me, was that they were all written in French. Um, and um, one of the things that Mary, so Mary always wrote in French. I think Elizabeth sometimes wrote in English, but you know that that expressed also a whole power relation. Mary, Queen of Scots, connected to France, resisting the English, what pretending to the English throne, using French to challenge Elizabeth, Anglo Elizabeth. Yeah, but, uh, that's I think a, a kind of I'm 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 I'm, I'm on my way to, and I'm not on my way to an elevator moment because it's this isn't something that i know so i can't i'm not gonna it's not gonna come to me afterwards um well, he actually uh, put something up here but bef before oh. i moved out what he thinks is his answer is um my theory about why they were all in french is it's an example of that french versus english attitude about the language i don't think mary would have answered the letters if uh if elizabeth mm -hmm. hadn't been, <laughs> written them in french yeah. she just would have refused to communicate in a in an inferior language. So Lasso says Henry V or Edward III is my guess, but I really don't know. So he was, so none of us knows, so none of us needs to feel terribly bad about it. So well, anyway, I, um, I believe this is the end of the thing and that someone will come in and interfere or we will say goodbye. Oh, there you are, Candace. She's fabulous. <laughs> Hello, Candace. She's Hi, fabulous. how are you? Um, thank you both so much for speaking. Uh, this has been very intriguing. I know no French at all, except for the words that you've mentioned that we use in English, but I've been here with my wife who speaks French, uh, and she's enjoyed it a lot, so thank you. Um, I want to thank the audience as well. Thank you all for watching uh, this afternoon with us, if you're uh, in, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I want to encourage you to purchase Richard's book, through third place book through the button uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you'd like to follow Town Hall on Crowdcast to see more of our content on here, you can follow us using the button at the top right of your screen. Um, thank you so much, Richard, for joining us at this odd hour uh, for you. And um, I hope that uh, you, help. you both have a great day. Thanks. Thank you very much for the, uh, I want to thank you all for coming and also for, uh, for the for allowing a matinee to finish yeah absolutely finish on a french word and thank you kathleen uh, very much thank you for writing the book it's wonderful <laughs>